members of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda for the evening. Um, so what I'll do is I'll unmute everyone and then we have some members of the public here if they want to say something that will be the time that they can announce themselves. So I'm going to unmute everyone if you're a member of the public and would like to say something, please let us know. Uh, this is Kevin O'Connell and I'm just here for the number seven on the agenda, which is the development review board review. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm just curious, can you see my image or is it just, or is there a feature within Zoom that allows you to blank out some of the, which is fine. I'm just trying to understand the technology. Oh, so if you go to the top of your view, you can change it to, or um, block view. Okay. Change your view. I don't want to take up any more time. So just- You're fine, thank you. Yep, thank you. Great, anyone else? And Donna. Yes, Donna. Yeah. Would we like to put the appointments early so that the individuals <sighs> don't have to wait? Uh, I think that is uh, the plan already, um, right as far as I can tell, but right after the consent agenda. Great. Is, but I don't have but that early is good. Screen. I agree. Okay, good. Okay, great. Um, I think it's probably important to note also uh, before we dive into it that um, there had been a little bit of confusion about whether or not we'd be taking up anything related to the parking garage this evening and the answer is we're not talking we're not taking up anything related to the parking garage uh, this evening so I just want to make sure that that's really clear um, uh, any other comments or comments from the public okay all right, so um, moving on to the consent agenda, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. I'll second. Further discussion? Uh, uh, uh. All in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Okay, so the consent agenda oh, passes. Uh, all right, so on to uh, some appointments. So we're gonna start with uh, the Development Review Board. Um, so I know uh, there's at least a couple folks here for that. Um, so the, I think the thing to do will be to invite uh, uh, folks who are on the line with us to introduce themselves. Um, and then we will very likely go into executive session because I think there's You frozen, Ann. We lost Ann, huh? We lost. Yep. <clears throat> Did everyone get the executive conference line email as well? Yeah. Yes. yes. Executive Thanks, session. Cameron. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not sure if I did. I'll have to check. Thanks. I'll I'll send it to you. Okay. Thank you. Looks like maybe, looks like maybe she's trying to get back in.
So the mayor just said her internet went out. Ooh. So I don't know. I don't know what that means. Whether she's going to call in or what. So Donna, I think you're up. <laughs> well, I would entertain whether we want to go into executive session dealing with these appointments. Maybe we should have the people. Uh, make their presentation to us first. There, there are some people present who uh, are applicants. Certainly. I'd agree with that. Sorry, I've just got a text from Ann. Just, yep. So anyone here would like to speak? I believe uh, Kevin spoke up earlier. Would he like to start? Great. Sure. Uh, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. And no image or do you see an image? No image. No image. Okay. Let me try. Your bottom left hand corner um, will have an unmute and a camera button on Zoom. There's a stop video or start video that if you hit that should give you a screen. <laughs> Sorry, folks. I just uh, lost. Okay, here we go. Hey, hey, <laughs> there you are. Where? What's this? Well, I'm glad you can see me. I can't see myself, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just I just wanted to be available. Uh, you have my application before you. Uh, I'm asking for uh, a reappointment uh, for another two years, and um, you know, I just any questions the book. Council may have or the mayor. Um, I'm happy to uh, to entertain them. Any questions? Anyone for Kevin? Not for me. I'll just, I'll just ask. I'll ask a really simple. Hey, Kevin, how how many years have you been on the DRV? A, bit, a few, a few. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was at. I I was appointed to, to the DRV at its inception. 2002. Okay. I've been a member for that entire time. And then ZBA before that, right? Correct. I'm sorry, uh, Jack, what was that abbreviation? Zoning Board of Adjustment. Thank you. Sorry. In 2002, uh, the, uh, uh, the Zoning Board and the what was then the Planning Commission uh, were combined, and that's where the DRB comes from. Okay. I don't have anything else. No, no other questions. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kevin. I, Appreciate I it. I really enjoy it. And I think this is a time uh, that we're entering when uh, uh, we're all going to be a little bit more sober about how we approach our, our jobs uh, in the city. It's, uh, uh, it's going to be a challenging time ahead. Thank you. Great. Cameron, thank is, you. is there any other candidates online? RJ. Hey there. RJ, RJ Adler. And then I'm going to do a call for if Michael Lazorchak and then Gene Leon. But RJ, please. RJ. Hey, folks. Um, I introduced myself last time, and I see a lot of familiar faces on here. So I'll make my introduction less uh, in depth as it was. But I just moved to town um, in, on February 29th. I made the really great decision to quit my job then. Uh, and I, uh, my fiance lives in town and we've been doing a long distance thing. I've been living in Middlebury for about 10 years. Um, uh, I've got a career history that encompasses some common uh, doing sales and marketing for them and working in fundraising at the Q Aiden Foundation. Uh, currently, I am gainfully employed uh, working with Wheelpad, which is uh, a home attachment uh, for folks with disabilities uh, that can transform a home into being a uh, ADA accessible 
um, un universally accessible space for folks that need to recover at home. Um, that's part time. And then part of my time, I'm also uh, working on trying to make ADUs more accessible here in Vermont. Um, I very much recognize that that line of work uh, coincides with what the DRB does, but I have an interest in being involved in my town. And I believe it was uh, Dan last time asked, you know, what I would do about conflict of interest type stuff. And I would step away if there were a, you know, conflict of interest when it comes to when it comes to my work. Um, other boards I've been on, six years on the Middlebury Co-op Board and uh, three years on the Middlebury Energy Committee. And uh, then, you know, a few uh, miscellaneous short-term boards here and there as well. Um, but, Sam Juan. Any questions for RJ? No. Okay, so Anne is back with us. Yes. Mayor? Yes, phew. So <laughs> next person, uh, camera instead was available was Michael. I don't know if he's online yet. Thank you, RJ. Thanks. Michael oh. Lazarczyk here? I don't think so. Okay, and I don't see Jean, Leon, and the other person who had applied was uh, David Weir. And I don't see him either. Just want to pause there in case I'm wrong, but I. I uh, David's I name was not on the agenda sheet. That's correct. Uh, uh, we had gotten an email from Jasmine saying that he had applied late and we could choose to. Um, not accept that application um, if we don't want to um, because of that. Uh, but that's uh, you know something we can potentially discuss in executive session. And um, since one of these seats uh, is supposed to be an alternate seat, I think that probably uh, is a good reason to go into executive session to um, to discuss that part of it. Um, who you know who's getting what seat so um i don't think there's anyone else to introduce themselves at this point uh so is there uh, a motion to go into executive session i'll make i'll make that motion to go into executive session to uh deliberate on the appointment for the development review board positions with the applicants second i, I assume that means we should go so no, no, no actually. Um, I was just going to ask Cameron to walk us through that. So yeah, I've, please do. So the way it. we've set up executive session for tonight is that all of our council members are going to disconnect from this call. They have a separate Zoom meeting that they're going to do on their own, which is executive sessions for like them leaving the room. And then you guys get to hang out with me until they all come back. So um, we can leave this line open. Okay, and so we'll be back on this Maybe. call um, briefly, uh, but we got to we got to vote though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so okay, uh, there was a motion and second. All in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed. Okay. All right. Well, we will be right back. Hey, Cameron, do you want us? To, you want us to leave this meeting and then rejoin? Yes. Uh, Cameron, you're muted. That's what she Sorry. said. I don't think you can be in two meetings at the same time. So I didn't think so. Yeah, I didn't know if we could open that. Right. That's fine. So you, we, we leave this meeting, log into the executive session meeting, and when that's done, we come back to this meeting. And the folks Perfect. that are here will. Okay, great. See you soon. And to come out of executive session. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, and is there a motion regarding the appointment? I move that we appoint Kevin O'Connell, uh, Michael Azorchak, and RJ Adler to uh, permanent seats on the Development Review Board, and Jean Leon uh, as an alternate. Second. Second. 
<laughs> I don't the, think you want to call them permanent by, seats. I was going to say, but <laughs> clarify. <laughs> a friendly amendment to the, as opposed to permanent, full-time. Full-time seats, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so uh, there's been a, a motion and a... Uh, uh, Jack, did you mention the alternate in that? Yes, I did. You did, okay. Yes. Uh, so there's, there's been a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Congratulations. Thank you all for uh, your past work and future work uh, on the board. We're Thank thrilled you for to have your time, you. Council. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all your time, Kevin. Yeah. Welcome aboard, RJ. Thanks. Well, from RJ, yeah. Okay. All right. So we have another appointment to the um, Homelessness Task Force. And so Carolyn Ridpath had applied to that. Now, in all honesty, I was actually a little bit unclear as to whether there was a, a vacancy uh, for this uh, position. Uh, I assume there is one. Uh, Cameron or Bill, can, is there any clarity on that? Yeah, there is a vacancy. There is a vacancy, okay. And all right, we had, um, I am a, a member stepped down. He had to move. Okay. Uh, and Lauren, did you have a question? Just, and I know we had talked about most task forces being on hold. Is the homelessness task force continuing to meet during this time or is this a future looking appointment for when committee work begins up again? Yeah. It has not been meeting and this would be like most of right now for when we start meeting again. We decided, um, and if the council would rather change this, let us know. We decided that uh, as terms expire and things become vacant, that we probably still wanted to, you know, put people on these committees rather than suddenly have a big pile of them when committees, you know, when, when we finally come back to being active and suddenly you've got 10 seats to fill in committees that we at least keep filling the slots in the case there was written correspondence that needed to go out, but they're just not actually meeting, but they're we're still taking care of their membership, if that makes any sense. Yep. It does. I'll, we'll I'll make a motion. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dan. Oh, unless there was any further discussion, I'm, I'm happy to make a motion. Uh, go for it. I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion that we appoint Carolyn Redpath to the Homelessness Task Force. Second. Okay, okay. Uh, any further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Great. And congratulations to Carolyn. Thank you for your work. Um, and so just to clarify, we are going to address um, later on in this meeting the uh, future continuation of um, whether or not committees and boards are meeting. That's correct? Well, okay. So we'll, we'll revisit that topic um, shortly. Um, all right. So chapter 13 uh, review. Uh, so hopefully everyone's got that available. Um, so I think it probably just makes sense to take this one section of, at a time, just for context. We've been going through all of our ordinances and cleaning up some language. Uh, and um, so we had actually had chapter 13 on our agenda for review uh, back in like December or um, last year anyway. And it, I don't think it ever went to a second reading, and I know this is listed as a first reading, um, which is fine. Um, but uh, just just to, I want to acknowledge that we, I think we may have talked about this at least once, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, any other context for right. this that you, that Bill or Cameron, you want to provide? Uh, no, and in fact, thanks for the reminders. I'm looking through it again, I can see, I think you're right, this looks familiar. Um, no, I mean, this was worked on by the folks involved with these things. We have heard from the tree board and the parks commission that they would like to weigh in some more. <laughs> um, and, you know, we told them this is the first reading, there's gonna be a second reading, so there's time. So you may expect to hear more from those two boards before we're done. It, and whether or not those boards actually even continue to meet. I mean, the rec board may meet, but I, the tree board may not. Um, 
So right. want to at least flag that it may, we, we may be revisiting sections of this uh, too, if, you know, right. it comes to that. Okay. Uh, so on to the different sections. So um, the first section being about trees, uh, any comments on uh, chapter 13, section uh, in the 300s? Uh, Jack. Um, while we discuss this, I think we all got uh, a set of comments from uh, John Snell about this. And I thought that his, uh, most of his comments were things that we should adopt. And so I think what I'll go, what I'll, I'm likely to do is wanna move all the uh, comments or most of the comments that John proposed. And I don't know if the way to do that is for, for us to do it now at this meeting or have that those go back into the uh, what's being worked on. But we have section 3301. Uh, John makes a comment that uh, the tree board is consists of citizens and residents of the city. And he says that he understands that non-residents non can also serve. And uh, that, uh, that seems like a valuable thing, at least as non-voting uh, members. Um, so I actually can't see the comments that John Snell made. How are you seeing that? I just pulled it up. We got an, got it in an email uh, the other day, and I have it on my screen side by side with the uh, with the Zoom app. And I'm not sure if this and is something. Jasmine emailed it. I think it was earlier today or yesterday with John's comment. So it was an email from Jasmine. Yeah, I, I wondered. I did it. I just you for you forwarded it. it. Okay, because yeah, I yeah. I had thought that I looked at that and I couldn't figure out how to see the. And John's comments. So maybe I'll I'll uh, keep digging here for a second. But uh, Jack, what's your what's your thought about um, incorporating John's comments? Can, I'm sorry, I was distracted by the fact that like I didn't have them. <laughs> I, I think it's a good idea to incorporate pretty much all of them. Some of them are sort of editorial type comments. Some of them are more substantive. But he's. He might be the chair of the tree board, and whenever he comes to the council, he has, uh, I think, very valuable things to say, and I think he has good uh, points about this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Help if uh, I yeah. read through his comments. I'm sorry. Sorry, say that again, Cameron. Would it help if I read through his comments? How extensive are they? <laughs> Well, they go through the whole tree section. Um, I think there are changes you could look to adopt or or take into consideration. Another version, another thing we could do is uh, come back with a draft that has John's comments. In yeah, it. I was I, I was just going to suggest that because some of his comments are. It looked like he looked at a version that hadn't been um, edited uh, because some of his. Some of his comments in the version that I received uh, as part of our packet, you know, had been addressed. So there was like a, a pronoun issue. And if you look at the original, it's because it was already struck through. Um, so it may be helpful to do it that way. He it, it it seemed like he had a couple of suggestions. The one Jack that that were substantive. The one Jack pointed out about expanding the met, uh, the membership of the tree board beyond the residents and citizens of the city. Um, and then he had a, a technical one, um, you know, at the, uh, towards the, towards the back end, but on, on the, um, on the question of membership, do we have any other boards uh, that allow non residents to be members of? Yeah, I think yeah. there's quite a few. Okay. So typically the council has, this is really a policy call of the city council. Uh, that over the years, the council has been very strict about DRB planning commission 
TRC, you know, anything with any kind of regulatory authority, feeling that, you know, our own residents should be taking those regulatory roles. Uh, I think a DRC actually, one time I can remember, I think we may have had someone from East Montpelier who was a landscape architect or something. So they have special expertise, but typically the council said for, for anything regulatory, we want residents. For other boards, um, you know, we've often had, you know, maybe an interested party or a business owner might be on the board or, a, a, you know, somebody who has a particular expertise. Um, but even I know when we, when you recently appointed the homelessness task force, uh, there were several people who were very capable and the council chose the Montpelier residents uh, first. So it's, it's, I think it's been, you get more points if you're, if you're a local resident, but it isn't necessarily been a, a blanket prohibition. This ordinance clearly states a prohibition. So uh, obviously if you wanted to offer the opportunity to broaden it, then you would want to change that ordinance. So um, what do we think about uh, creating a draft that might incorporate John's comments uh, and for, for second reading. Works for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I went through his comments and a lot of them, like Dan said, were sort of typos and like just real simple things, but trying to point out a couple of those more substantive ones that we might want to discuss is, is where we want to be and based on the, the draft that he was working with. So that, that makes that's more efficient use of time. Sounds good to me. Uh, Dan, go I think ahead. the ind indication um, they did indicate that um, they were they and I think as you said, the Parks Commission. Uh, excuse me, yeah, Parks Commission may want to weigh in, or John at least personally may want to weigh in if it's not the full. That, uh, that's Dan and, if we and, get, and Lauren. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, Bill, did I you mean, have anything I, further? Well, I was, you know, I didn't mean to cut anybody off. We, I was going to say, if we get other comments, we'll try to figure out a way to set those up so that it's an easy read and compare. We'll, we'll incorporate John's now in a draft, but then we'll figure out a way to finish. So and here's what Park said, and here's John's additional comments. So it's because it's hard to do it in this format. The, the uh, one question yeah, go ahead, Dan. I, yeah, the one, I mean, the one question I think, John, it would be actually helpful if John could come um, because I, I had a couple of questions about, like, for example, the street tree species to be planted. We have a very uh, select list of those. And if there was anything that was, you know, animating those choices, like I noticed the flowering crab apple had come off of the proposed, um, you know, change. Um, and the Bradford pear and the green ash, if that's driven by maintenance concerns or if that's driven by um, hardiness or any other you know, invasive versus non-native species kind of considerations, it would be helpful to understand that. Because you know, one thing that it seems, if my understanding is correct, that when we're talking about street trees, we're not just talking about trees on streets, on public streets, but this, the definition, the way it does, is it, it overlaps into the public right of way. So this could technically affect some private landowners if if the street right of way carried over into the front yard. Like I know some properties along uh, some of particularly in more narrow streets. Um, I know that there's been at least I've. I, it, it seems like a potential area, and it would be helpful for clarification as to those species. Yeah. Well, so let's make a point to invite him to the next time we take this up. Um, Lauren. Uh, kind of on that point, if, if I'm remembering right, the last time we had looked at this, we had even talked about whether it made sense to be having the specific species in ordinance or have the tree board be maintaining an updated appropriate list based on certain criteria or something instead of listing the trees um, and then having to update them as science evolves or whatever, but more if we wanted to leave that in the hands of the tree board with whatever criteria they use, if we felt like those were the right ones. So that was, that was one idea. So maybe John could provide us advice on if, if that might work. 
better and be more kind of adaptable over time, um, or if it gives them more clarity to just put it in ordinance and have, have a list and he feels like this will be a long lived one. <laughs> Um, so that's one thought. And then the other, I mean, it seems like the only other really substantive thing was um, there's a license fee um, and he was said they've never enforced that. So either we should decide do we want to keep that fee and start enforcing it. I know that we've also moved a lot of the license fees into the license fee section and not put them in different sections. So if we want to keep it, I think for cleanliness, consistency, putting it there instead, um, but maybe, but just want to flag that as a more substantive question to us all if we want to want to keep a fee and if so, enforce it or if it's never been enforced, do we really, do we want to keep it? Uh, Jack. Yeah, I had a couple of substantive thoughts and I don't know, since Lauren just mentioned the licensing section, section 13, 319, I could talk about that now, but and I could talk about the other ones too, if you want, but uh, as they're in a couple of different sections. Um, we've, I've spent a lot of time looking at the licensing section and I'm sure we'll get, uh, of the ordinances, and I'm sure we'll get back to that chapter at some point, and I'm partly the holdup anyway. But uh, I question with a lot of our municipal licenses whether it's, uh, of whether there's a point to having the city issue uh, licenses at all, especially if the people are regulated at some other level. And for the arborist license, it occurred to me that there is, uh, it's not a government ent entity, but there's an international society of arborists that does certify arborists. And it occurred to me if someone is a certified arborist, maybe that's that's probably going to be a higher standard than whatever licensing scheme the city comes up with. And so we might exempt someone who's a certified arborist from, uh, from that licensure. And so I have language for that. Um, it is starts on line three of section 13-319. And it says the license fee shall be $25 annually in advance. And my suggested additional language is, unless that person is an arborist certified by the International Society of Arborists. And I should disclose that my son is an arborist certified by the International Society of Arborists. So he would personally, if he were doing this, he would be personally uh, affected, although he's the city arborist right now. Alec Ellsworth is also a certified arborist. Head of parks. So I would suggest putting that language in. John Odom, do you have any comments on the licensing thing? Just to, you know, remind folks that the, uh, that I think we have licenses so that we have some authority uh, if there's a bad actor to have some option to act. Um, and not simply depend on the state or the state to get around to it or something like that. So that's that's really the point of the ones we have. As far as the, the licensing that we're in, in particular, I got no comments. So on that point, Jack, um, so you, you have some language uh, around this that you would want to suggest? Yes, and if other people aren't don't find that compelling, I, I'm not married to it. I just, uh, as I say, it's just a suggestion, um, and it's the language that I read uh, a few minutes ago. Unless that person is an arborist certified by the International Society of Arborists. Well, so. Um is your thought that 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 person would still have to get a license with the city, but the twenty five dollar fee would be waived, or they don't have to get a license at all? Well, that's a good question. Um, the way where I put it, it has to do with it's in a sentence about the fee, but really it makes more sense to have it be not getting a license at all. So it could go. I can go either way. 
And I, I, can, I certainly see the justice of John's uh, comment. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Well, I, 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 in thinking about John's comment, I mean, I, I would think that it would be more potent or powerful if there was a requirement um, rather than a $25 licensing fee um, that, uh, you know, so adopting Jack's language for that, but, you know, you would still grant a license to those international arborists, but the, the real key language would be requiring some sort of insurance or bond to cover it because we're, we're talking about street trees or park trees, which are both usually in close to right of ways, highly trafficked areas. So that if some Yahoo takes down a tree, you know, can it can take out power, it can cause traffic snarls, it can cause damage to people. Um, you know, I think that's what we're concerned about with regulating these things. So I think it's and, and and looking at the language right now, it only seems like we have a requirement for insurance or bonding if they're doing a contract with the city. Um, is there a reason why we wouldn't have that language be? broader such that if anybody was seeking to do work within the city, they'd have to show a minimum bonding or insurance level. So I hear a couple different questions in that. Um, Dan, do you have, so, so Dan, you're suggesting that perhaps in, either in addition to, or instead of a license that they show that basically that they are insured Right, or, or be able to put up a bond to do work in okay. the city, um, you know, especially if they're to, to, to work on, because the language right now is they only have to have the license in if they're pruning, treating, or removing a street or a park tree within the city. Um, so if somebody has a back 40 and they want to do it, however, that, that's fine. But if, if you're doing a street tree or park tree, you have to procure this license. And so, I, and I agree, my thought is a little bit muddled and perhaps has a, several questions buried within it. But my, my main point is, isn't the key point here of what we want is to make sure that somebody has some sort of insurance or protection so that if they should violate a certain standard, rather than trying to sort of get bad actors, get into the business of regulating bad actors, which I don't think we really want to do, we have some requirement that at least there would be an insurance policy or some bonding policy so that, um, you know, it would in some way self-regulate, which is insurance companies won't insure people who behave badly for very long. And if somebody does behave badly and they have an insurance policy, at least there's a pot of money to seek um, to repair the damage done. Um, Jack. I agree with that. I think that, um, uh, we don't know exactly what the language is now, but some kind of, uh, bonding requirement for, uh, working on street and park trees makes a lot of sense to me. And so maybe we should put a placeholder in and figure on having something in there for, for their next reading. You know, I could also see that as a part of the requirements in order to obtain a license, uh, but that, so um, so maybe that's a question of like, do you put language about being able to procure a bond or uh, that you're sufficiently insured to a certain level? Um, does that language go in the language of the ordinance or is that somehow on the document that uh, one, would have to fill out in order to get a license. And I mean, this is a topic that I feel like has come up in the past um, for a variety of other types of licenses that we issue. You know, we have all sorts of thoughts as to like, you know, do, we would only want to license this kind of um, enterprise if they're meeting XYZ requirements, um, which could be sort of a, uh, could be a, a rabbit hole. It could be uh, the kind of thing maybe we, uh, it, it could be, a, a, you know, regulating things that maybe we're not ready to regulate, but uh, it's, but it, I think it's a, a worthwhile question. Do you have any thoughts on like whether you would want to 
have that language be a part of the ordinance or as a part of the app, like the requirement to get the license? I, I would think it would be part of the ordinance because how, how else would the city clerk know what the requirements are to uh, issue a license and how would, how else would someone, how would else would an applicant either comply with or challenge the re requirement if it's not part of the ordinance? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, any other thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I would, I would support that as well. Okay, so that's something we can um, incorporate into uh, this for next for the next reading as well. Okay. Um, is Jack, we may contact you just to work through your thoughts on the language there. Sure. Okay. Any other thoughts on this, the trees section? Oh, let me see. Uh, go ahead, Jack. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm looking at uh, section 13-305, uh, which sets forth when the uh, meetings of the tree board are held, the first Wednesday of each month at 7.30 p.m. And they're, they're actually at present held on the first Thursday at 5.30 p.m. But, and it also just makes me wonder, are there other boards that where the meeting dates are set forth in our ordinances and should, because should we really be handcuffing the, uh, the board to a particular schedule or should we have it say something like meetings shall be scheduled uh, by the board or something like that? That seems like a great catch there. Right, we can scan through that. I will tell you, it may be a, a product of another day. Uh, it used to actually be in the charter when the city council met. It, the charter said second and fourth third Wednesdays. Wow. And uh, we've since changed that. Um, we've continued to follow the tradition, but we can move it around. But it, uh, So I have a feeling that at one point, these were all very carefully prescribed and uh, we've been trying to catch those and take them out. So this would be another good catch. Great. Um, did uh, did folks see John Snell's other sort of general comments about the relationship between um, relations of the of the board to review tree uh, related applications to the DRB? Um, and do, you, do you, are you familiar with the comments I'm, I'm referring to? No. Okay. So um, I just want to flag um, some of the comments that John wanted to make in addition. Um, were about that, the relationship of the board to review tree-related applications to the DRB. That was one thing. A second thing was um, uh, he mentions that uh, rather than focus solely on allowed trees, that uh, we also include a list of prohibited trees, which I think sort of gets at your comment, Lauren, about, uh, you know, is there just a list that we can reference here that the tree board just maintains? Um, the idea of prohibited trees, I think, is interesting. I think we'd probably only prohibit them in the you know city's right of way, uh, potentially. But then, you know, what are the consequences of that? Um, and then uh, the third thing was um, uh, just additional protections. Um, so anyway, I just want to flag that just so that people are aware of that for future discussions. Uh, yeah. Any other comments on the tree section? No. Okay. All right. Uh, and so moving on to recreation it was pretty short. Any comments here? No. Okay, great. Uh, and parks. Uh, Jack, go ahead. I noticed that <laughs> in, in article five, we have, uh, we have provisions regarding two of our parks and it just made me think, well, should we talk to the, uh, to the parks commission about uh, adopting similar 
sets of policies for the other parks in the city. And I don't know what those should be, but I think those would first come from the Parks Commission. Uh, Donna. Yes, that's, I agree, Jack, uh, even more so to be in line with their green print. They really are concerned that we only consider our parks to be Hubbard Park, North Branch, and I'm surprised Summer Street is here. So they would definitely like to see this enhanced. Great. So um, are, there, are there still meeting, right? They're one of the few groups that's still meeting during this time. And they're an elected body, so they can do it. Right. Yeah. So, okay. so um, we just want to get in touch with them for comments on this. Right. Yeah. I'll talk right. here. And I think, okay. we, now that I'm looking at this again, I think we also wanted to get comments from them about the Summer Street Park, about the, you know, the team sports and you know, some of the restrictions there. I mean, I guess yeah. I can understand hardball, softball, hockey, uh, but the team sports by anyone over 10 seemed. It, it has to do with the space and when the park was first done and, and right. the way it's right tucked in around the houses, but yes. Oh, I get it, but like if- Much more if discussion. wanted to play volleyball or, you know, ultimate Frisbee or some, some sport like that, you know, and what if they're 11 and not 10? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Um, okay, any other comments on the park section for now? Uh, Connor. What about like uh, just municipal staff or city staff rather than, uh, you know, park staff in particular as far as driving around in the parks there? I imagine there might be instances where other uh, city employees would go up there. Nothing big. Any comments on that? It's, you're you're suggesting um, that we add language to allow that? Just instead of accept parks and trees staff, I think it's in B there right off the bat. Like just make it city staff and mm. municipal staff. Yeah. Seems fair. Any any objections to that? Well, well um, the only thing is, go ahead, Donna. You need to talk to them because this is really about being driven on. Uh, roads that are not established park roads. So only park and tree staff can go and operate motor vehicles off the established roads. So I think there would be concern, maybe unless invited or less designated, I think they would want some restriction. Maybe you could say on city business. Yeah, but I think they have to be authorized through somebody, but maybe that's the way to do mm. it. But, mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. Um, Cameron or Bill, any thoughts on that? Um, I don't I don't think that very often city staff goes onto unmarked trails in the in the park other than park staff, but I think it's a pretty good catch-all to say accept city of Montpelier staff on city business and then we don't have to worry about it. Um, you never know. We use like our DPW folks help other folks who help rec folks who help park folks. So we don't want to back ourselves into a corner by any means. Hmm. Lauren, did you have something you wanted to add to that? No. Okay. No. Okay. Other oh. thoughts? Oh, Dan. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I, I just had one question is the, uh, the firearm prohibition if that's been reviewed for sort of current constitution data, um, if that's current constitutionality, um, I know we can restrict discharges, but I know that other park districts have been challenged as to whether they can carry uh, firearms. And I'm just, I'd be concerned of setting it up for some challenge somewhere. Um, has that been vetted? Bill or Cameron by any of uh, by the not, city lawyers to not recently that, that I'm not recently that I'm aware. We can ask Tony. 
So we probably want to check with an attorney. Um, I, I still what Dan's saying is that the state's pretty clear that we can regulate discharge, uh, but can we tell them they can't carry it or have mm -hmm. it on their person? Um, and, and the question is, is there's something different about parks than, you know, like schools I know can prohibit those. You know, there's certain places that you're allowed to, but I'm not sure. Uh, so we have to look. Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, anything else for the parks? Okay. Uh, flood insurance rate maps, gone. Nothing, any, any comments on that one? <laughs> okay, great, moving on. Um, natural resources. Any thoughts on that section? Nope, hearing none. Um, okay, last one, rivers and streams. Thoughts on this one? Okay. It's a pretty short section anyway. All right, so um, is there a motion to pass first reading as amendment and set the date for the next reading? I move that we pass the ordinance as amended for first re reading and schedule a second reading. I don't know what, what the best time would be. Probably not our next meeting because we're asking for people to get us some feedback. So maybe 27th, May 27th. Yeah. Second meeting in May. Yep. Okay. There's been a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Further discussion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, great. All right, so we'll take that up on the 27th. Thanks for all of your thoughts on that, team. Uh, okay, and so I think we're uh, moving on to uh, the uh, update for COVID-19. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to either Bill or Cameron. And watch the ball just not even slow down on its way to Cameron. Okay. Okay, so I sent y'all a memo earlier today. We go through that. And then I also have another memo that was sent out with the agenda about the rec center. Um, I'll read that one second, if you're okay with that, Mayor. Okay, um, so the state has given a few updates since we last spoke. Some of them were pretty substantial. Um, just so everyone is on the same page. Um, Governor Scott has announced an extension of the state of emergency in Vermont through May 15th. Um, he also uh, gave a directive through the Attorney General to law enforcement on how they should be enforcing that executive order, um, including voluntary compliance on social distancing. Um, we can pursue civil and criminal enforcement of the order which does include up to $1,000 a day fine for continued non-compliance. That's not something that's come up. Um, people are being really great about complying with the governor's orders. That is just something that our um, police department was given through the attorney general. Um, our farmer's market is aware and has been doing a great job keeping up direct orders from their vendors, but the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets did say that farmer's markets are currently not permitted under the terms of the stay at home order. Um, and then the most substantial one in this past week, Governor Scott did announce addendum 10 to his executive order, which outlines a phased reopening of businesses in Vermont. Um, they announced it today as sort of a quarter turn of the spigot to open it back up. Um, but that did come with mandatory health and safety guidances that have been required of all businesses, including our government that is currently in operation. So we did come up with some new policies to protect our staff and residents, including um, putting in that addendum 10 um, health and safety guidelines into operation. A lot of that is about wearing masks when you're in public, and we wanna make sure that our staff 
is within those guidelines. So we're trying to make sure everyone has a cloth mask or face covering and making sure they have guidelines on how to use those and to clean their space with a regularity. We also have updated our webpage for situational updates pretty much constantly. And those do have um, a growing list of resources for those who may need them. Um, I do wanna say publicly as a reminder, there is a group called uh, by the acronym Winock Rock that is open to receive calls for assistance if you need it between 8 and 10, 8 a.m. and 10 p.m., seven days a week. And their call line is 802-477-5160. I also wanna announce for Capital Area Neighborhoods that they're still looking for volunteers. They will start, um, they are starting to hand out flyers. They're flyering through the neighborhoods right now, um, letting people know what resources are available to them and that their neighborhoods have their backs. So we're excited about working with them. For business closures, program cancellations, or changes, know that City Hall is still currently closed. The Senior Center has canceled all their classes for spring, but their Feast to Go program is still continuing on Tuesdays and Fridays. The new pickup time for meals is now noon to 1230. It was noon to one, but everyone was already coming and picking up all their food by 1230, so our staff was just standing in the cold for a while, so we've shortened that time. Um, so everyone knows our recreation department has not made a determination on summer classes yet. So they are taking registration and payments for summer camp and other programming, but do not intend on cashing checks or depositing any of those payments until a determination has been made. Since we are furloughed a good quarter of our staff, um, this reduces um, a lot of our refunds needs. So either checks will either be processed if classes move forward returned or shredded depending on what the person would like to do. The Mountaineers has not yet determined if their summer baseball camps or their summer game season will be canceled or not. Um, in the memo, I provided a breakdown of uh, the furlough by department and division that was requested in our last meeting. Um, I won't go through that necessarily, but I do wanna thank again our volunteers because they have saved the city about an additional $170,000 and we'd really do appreciate that. Um, our city committees have all um, stopped meeting through today. Um, I will have a recommendation in a second about that continuing. Um, but as an update to our city communications, we've been working very closely with Winock Rock, the uh, Capital Area Neighborhood Groups, and Montpelier Mutual Aid. We have weekly calls with them, and we are continuing to share their messages publicly. Um, we've also been um, increasing our social media posts regarding COVID-19. Um, we average around 860 interactions per post, but our most successful one recently was about wearing masks, which reached almost 2,000 people. So we're continuing um, to be committed to posting our um, recommendations and best practices for um, supporting local businesses, maintaining social distancing, wearing masks in public, et cetera, as we get that information. Um, so my recommendation and something I would like to have um, council vote on or feedback on a discussion around is the continued suspension of all city committee advisory boards and task force meetings that are not required by law. Um, our staff's capacity remains incredibly limited. A good quarter of our staff is currently voluntarily furloughed. And we did not, we asked, we sent out a message to all committee chairs asking them, you know, what's going on with your committee? Is there anything that we can do to support you? Like, is there any timely things that you need to make decisions on? And we received two answers and both of them have since from, just so you know, the um, Senior Center Advisory Council and the, rec re the Recreation Advisory Board. And both of them have now told me that they don't necessarily need to meet. So that concludes my current updates. I don't know if so you just, want, go ahead. Uh, well, so, so just on the topic of uh, continued closure of uh, these committee meetings, board meetings, whatnot, uh, do we, uh, I, I guess I would be more comfortable uh, with that suggestion if there was a date at which we could, we would be revisiting it, right? Like we're, we're gonna plan on another set of, um, uh, 
you know, a few weeks of not meeting until such and such date, <laughs> and we'll have revisited it again versus just saying, you know, indefinitely. Um, I mean, unless we want to do indefinitely, but. Um, so or for think, a of, oh, sorry, Bill. I was going to say the same thing you're about to say. Maybe. Go. <laughs> Hers will be smarter. Uh, well, I was going to say our furloughed employees come back at the new, the end of the fiscal year, the beginning of our next fiscal year. Um, there is that deadline. Yeah, that was exactly what I was going to say. Is that this okay. for us? It's driven by the staff availability. It's not necessarily keep the committee safe. Is that we can't, we don't have the ability to track all the things and take the minutes and uh, post the agendas and arrange all the Zoom meetings and all that kind of thing. So um, that's what was driving our request. It wasn't you know, that they couldn't meet virtually because they certainly could, but then it has to happen now. So, so the idea would be that it would potentially be through the rest of this fiscal year. I would say until June 30, unless something changes. Obviously, you okay. can change it at any time. Okay. Um, thoughts on that particular topic, team? Uh, Jack. That makes sense to me. If uh, I, I'd be happy to make the motion right now to suspend, continue to suspend city committee advisory boards and task force meetings through June 30th. I'll second. Further discussion. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just say for myself, and um, uh, I think it probably makes sense uh, to do this. It does. It is kind of a bummer, though. There are, especially as we go into, uh, you know, talking about our strategic plan next week. I mean, there may be things that pertain to committees. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of them would be pretty. You know, if they're if they're excited about their work, they're going to be pretty bummed uh, that they're not going to be able to continue um, through the end of June. But you know, I'm, on the other hand, it'll be here before we know it, and you know that'll we'll we'll just move forward then. Um, so I have mixed feelings about it, but it's probably the right call, <laughs> at least for <laughs> from my perspective. Other thoughts. Well, and I'll just I'll just reinforce what Cameron said, which is we did reach out to all of them and say, you know, basically, can you can you make the case why you need to keep meeting or what you need from us? And, mm -hmm. and we only heard from two two boards. Uh, I would assume that if somebody wants to make their case between now and then, we could always bring it to the council. But the chance would be the general. Uh, Donna then Lauren. Well, I just wanted to say, I appreciate having sort of a date there, but we can revisit it as we get more information. It always can be changed. And things yeah. like the DRB, um, those, aren't, those aren't canceled, those aren't impacted by this, because those are the things that we need to do by law to get projects moving forward. So a lot of those things are not being canceled. Um, the reason I talk about staff capacity is really you think that each of these committees has a staff representative and a lot of them aren't here right now. Um, and so that work uh, that they normally do is not, or is being either reallocated to other staff or it just isn't possible to do right now. Fair enough. Uh, Lauren. Um, yeah, I, I think this makes sense. And thank you, um, Cameron and Bill, for, for doing that outreach to, to make sure that we weren't missing any opportunities. Um, I guess this does, you know, we'll still have the flexibility. I'm just thinking, like, for example, a, a potential city grant opportunity around clean energy had come across my desk, which I'd sent to Anne. But, like, I would hate to miss those kinds of opportunities. But I think we can still kind of keep our eyes on if there, there are oh, yeah. deadlines and things like that, particularly if it could help our budget <laughs> situation. Um, so, you know, we'll still have that flexibility, but I think this makes sense for today to just put everything on hold and then in special circumstances, we could revisit as needed. So if there's, um, I could picture, uh, putting something out to committees or task forces that if there's a, a time bound opportunity, uh, that maybe that they get in touch with you. I mean, maybe that's opening up too much of a door, but, um, you know, especially with an opportunity like a, a grant deadline or, um, 
you know, anything else that, that has a, some kind of deadline. Um, do, do, would you, how would you all feel about um, giving with a provision that like committees could get in touch um, if there was something urgent? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, there's a- Yeah. Yeah. For what it's worth, um, I've checked with uh, managers in a bunch of other towns and cities, and this is, this is we're not the only ones doing this. Fair enough. Um, so there was a motion and a second. Um, uh, to those who had the motion and second, is, so this provision for um, getting back in touch or revisiting it if there's an urgent um, matter or, um, or if they, you know, have anything else come up that they want to revisit for any special circumstances, they can. That's okay with you, with you all. Yes. Should we have, uh, should we have some uh, language for the clerk, like add at the <laughs> end of it, uh, provided that a committee, the chair of a committee, can consult with the city manager to obtain permission to meet in the case of. Uh, time limited opportunity or need. That's okay with you, Connor? Uh, friendly enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Donna. It, maybe it's just, it just seems strange to have that in a motion. I would assume they could. I would rather us just have the staff make the statement to chairs that please keep in mind that you sh we still would love to hear from you if these opportunities happen or if you feel something urgent. It just seems strange to put it in a motion, that's all. Yeah. I'm fine either way. Yeah, I, in a certain sense, it's as long as it's uh, concise enough, it's sort of already there. But it, uh, it, if if you're okay with it, Donna, but I mean, it yeah, doesn't. Okay. okay. It just um, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a little wordy, it's a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, well, so on any other, any other thoughts on this topic? Do you want to direct them to Bill or to Cameron? Do you have a preference? The city manager's office is fine. Okay. Yep. Okay. City manager's office. Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Great. All right. So June 30th then. There's okay, that so piece of it. I also have um, this. This is not. This is. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I'm interrupting Dan. Where's oh, Dan, frozen? did you have something? He's frozen. Okay. He, I think he was raising his hand to vote, and now he's frozen. Oh. Hmm. It looks like a great poster, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> An album cover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead, Cameron. So I do have another um, option or another consideration for a vote. And this one is, um, as you may know, pretty um, it's something I've been working on since I got here. Um, but my memo really is about um, needing to readjust and re-examine project timelines um, in response to coronavirus regarding the rec center renovation project timeline. Um, as you know, the project did hit some snares earlier this year when it came to implementation um, due to a loss of one of our project management team. Um, so we did hit a timeline snag there, but we have yet to hold, like to put out the RFP because our scheduled time to release the RFP was in early March. And um, that was really when the coronavirus started hitting and the stay at home order was um, put out there. And so uh, we had a lot of concerns about putting out an RFP when people were closed and unable to respond to that. Um, so right now to get um, the project ready, our RFP to create construction ready documents, if they, if we wanted that to happen before November and to get us bond ready in November, we would have needed to put that RFP out earlier this month or March even. Um, so for the goal of a November 2020 bond vote, right now that doesn't seem feasible because no one is open and able to respond to these RFPs to begin with. 
Um, so my recommendation would be a policy decision from council to push the RFP process back and to have the bond vote in the March 2021 um, uh, election so that we ensure a fair process, make sure that people have time and energy and the capacity to respond to the RFP. And we have a community that is um, more fully rebounded from the impacts of coronavirus, because I cannot imagine asking um, for that bond in November. Jack. I, I agree with this. I don't think it, it makes sense to try to proceed uh, in November. The question that occurred to me is whether we can be sure of being ready by March and whether it should be uh, whatever resolution we adopt should uh, give us the flexibility to by saying something like no earlier than the March uh, 2021 town meeting election. Cameron, did you need a, a motion on this? Well, you had adopted formally that it was going to go to bonds in November, so yes. And I think we, actually we've, we've also received some general inquiries about this, uh, including, um, this is very you know, preliminary, but someone who may be interested in doing some sort of private project and maybe, you know, so I, uh, they were curious about whether, what we were gonna do. And I said, well, we'll have clarity after tonight. Other thoughts? Uh, Dan. I like what, what yeah, I'll, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I, I was just gonna say, I, I, I agree with pushing this back. It doesn't make sense at this time. Um, and I support this um, just because I think it's for all the reasons that we've, we've talked about with other issues. It's just the more time we can have to think about it, it makes more sense. Uh, Donna, I just agreed with Jack's language of saying, you know, would allow the earliest March. I, I don't remember your exact wording, Jack, but I'd like the intention of it. So it gave leeway no sooner than March. I agree. And so do we, uh, it sounds like we need a motion to that effect. Uh, Go for it, Jack. Yeah, I move that uh, we delay the RFP process and schedule the bond vote for the recreation center no sooner than town meeting day 2021. I second. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and it, anything else um, from staff on that? Yeah. Okay, Connor. Yeah, Mayor, I just had a quick motion. Um, I was kind of taking the temperature with council. Um, and I, I learned that you had uh, zeroed out your salary for the rest of the fiscal year, which is really appreciated. Uh, you only make 4,000 bucks, so it's like a shilling or a half penny an hour. But even <laughs> so, I think it's important that... Um, you know, everybody sacrificed a bit. So I was going to make a motion that the council uh, zero out our salary for the rest of the fiscal year. It doesn't come out to too much money, uh, probably a little under 2K, but any bit helps. So yeah, just zero out the council salary for the rest of the fiscal year. That would be my motion. Second. I'll second. I think there were a couple seconds there. Um, any other discussion about this? I think it's just the right thing to do when we're we have our city employees sacrificing uh, that we share in that sacrifice. Yeah, I agree. And uh, and you know, I I want to make sure that no one feels like pressured uh, to do it, but you know, because uh, that could be really important income for um, any one of us at this point, but as long as it's something that is, uh, you know, that's okay, then then great. Um, but uh, anyways, there was a motion to second any further discussion. 
Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Well, and thank you all for, for your willingness uh, to pitch in what, what you can uh, during this time. While we're talking about budget, I'll just give an update. We are we will have um, some budget update for you at the next meeting. We want to see what the April numbers, end of April comes in and what we're looking at. Uh, we have found, we think, at least preliminarily, about 60,000 more that we can adjust the budget. So dropping that 113 down is, you know, you cut that in half. So, uh, and we're still working. And again, these are projections. So uh, we'll, have, we'll have more detail, but it's, we haven't forgotten it, continuing to look for, for places. Um, I also remind people uh, when we were talking about the, the regulations that people are under that there may be a loosening up of activity that the, at this point, the, the furloughs and the activity, the restricted activity of the city is as much a, a budget response as it is a safety response. So that we may start getting pressure that says, hey, you're now allowed to do X. Why aren't you doing it? And you know, we'll say, well, that person that does that is furloughed. And they'll say, well, but they can come back now. And that's a policy decision that we could revisit, but it has financial implications. So our our furlough and our budget thing plan is through June 30 for financial reasons, as much of it, if not more than, you know, COVID safety reasons. Just want to say that loud and clear for all the, to hear, because I could picture a scenario, particularly come June, where you know, things are starting to happen and the city's not. And it's, it's a number approaching. Uh, Lauren. I was just wondering, Bill, if you might be able to speak for a minute about um, what your understanding is about the federal stimulus, what kind of, you know, I, I feel like more and more guidance is coming to the state. I think it's still unclear what a city like Montpelier might be able to tap into with this, but just to kind of put out there what our current understanding is. And then is there any you know, advocacy, a letter or something from city council or that the mayor's coalition should be doing or anything to be um, working with our federal delegation on how the next stimulus can open up more resources for cities like Montpelier? Sure. I mean, I, I think, so we're tracking it. The, the League of Cities and Towns is really doing the lead work on that for us because we don't really have the, the capacity to do that. Um, one of the interesting things that uh, the way federal funds uh, through the CDBG system are allocated around the country is that uh, there are certain, if you're above a city above a certain size, you are what's called an entitlement community and you get direct allocations. So uh, Boston, Cambridge, Mass, race to work, we just got direct allocations. If any, for anybody below that, those go to the state. So as far as I understand, the only entitlement community in Vermont is Burlington. Everything else goes to the state, which is why our CDBG programs in Vermont, you know, we have to apply for CDBG grants and we get them. In large cities, they just get a bunch of money and they allocate it as long as they follow the program rules. And what I'm told is that, at least for the, the government money, so to speak, it's being allocated out using the CDBG formula. So the state of Vermont's basically getting all the money and they're going to have to determine how to reallocate that to towns and cities if they do, or if they use it for their own uh, roads and highways and infrastructure, uh, you know, whatever. That's often been the case is sometimes that uh, it doesn't get to the local governments. Uh, so anything we can do uh, to, to articulate our needs, I know the league is always asking us. We're hoping uh, there's supposedly a new infrastructure bill coming. Uh, Mayor 2008, there was, um, you know, shovel ready projects were, were the big deal. And, uh, you know, who knows, perhaps we might have one or two shovel ready projects, uh, depending on how things go. So that's what we know now. It's not very specific. I'm sorry, but we are definitely tracking it and waiting to see what, you know, I think the state's probably sorting through this and everyone's trying to figure out how to get their hands on it. So. And I assume you'll let us know when when there is clarity. <laughs> uh, but oh. <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, so, and just so you all are aware, um, the mayor's coalition is going to be gathering to discuss um, some kind of a platform related to COVID-19. I'm happy to share with you some potential uh, points of that, to get your feedback um, on, on any of any of those topics. So uh, I'll, I'll send that out uh, when this meeting is over. Um, happy to get your feedback. Uh, so circling back to uh, the capital area neighborhoods, um, there, we had a, I had, had a conversation with Dan earlier about um, just uh, some questions that had been raised about that. Uh, Dan, can I, can I pick on you to, to speak on that or do you want me to, to speak about that? Sure, no, I, 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 I can talk about it. Um, you know, I've had a couple conversations with some constituents about the capital area and neighborhoods and how that's developing. And, you know, one, one thing is that, you know, we as the city started the capital area and neighborhoods, but I think it was always, I, I think it might help for us to have a discussion about what our vision as a city council is for that. Um, you know, my, my understanding and what I've talked with others about is the idea that capital area neighborhoods would be sort of this decentralized opportunity for neighborhoods to develop um, groups as they saw their needs being uh, existing at the time. And so, uh, you know, if one neighborhood had a really strong desire for, um, you know, door to door service or, or uh, you know, communication with neighbors door to door, and another neighborhood said, no, we're inundated, we just, we're thinking more after this is all over, we wanna have some potlucks. Um, I think that's that's fine. And that's sort of the vision of the capital area neighborhoods. But I, you know, I think it's, it's helpful for us to have this discussion so that when constituents do call us and say, hey, I don't know if I necessarily agree with what I'm being told by others um, of what this, what this capital area neighborhood group should be doing or what I should be doing as a part of it. Um, and, and whether, we as a council, you know, see that that's something we should be directing more attention to or central control. My sense is that the more it can be decentralized and let each neighborhood develop their own needs and responses or responses to their own needs or what they see as their own needs, the better and the more likely these groups are to succeed and to continue. I think that encapsulates what, I, what I've heard. I don't know if that meets everything you, you've heard as well, Anne. Yeah, I well, so I um, uh, agree. I just want to reinforce the point too that they're certainly not uh, obligatory, uh, and that if they, right. you know, if for any member of the public, if it feels like too much to try to have another thing to keep track of, that it's really okay. You don't have to. This is opt in. Um, it's been, I think, a useful vehicle for some members of the community already. Um, just in, in terms of uh, having connection with their neighbors and feeling like there are people who have their back and knowing who they can reach out to, especially uh, folks who may not be as connected digitally. Uh, but on the other side of it, if, if this is uh, just adding to the noise of your life, then it's really okay to, um, to not opt in. Um, and that's, uh, so I just want to make sure that, that that's really clear, but the, but also just um, reinforcing what you were saying, Dan, too, about, um, you know, this is meant to uh, be organic and absolutely can look different in different places. If some neighborhood wants to have a Google group, great. If another neighborhood wants to have like a Facebook group, great. So, you know, whatever, whatever works for that community um, and for those organizers that, that live in that space. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then it's, it's, it's an opportunity as another tool for us to communicate with each other and uh, get the word out about opportunities or needs or, or uh, whatnot. So, uh, and that ultimately really probably the highest purpose of it is to, to build relationships and connections with our neighbors um, in whatever that um, looks like, you know, either they're in terms of celebrating or, or meeting needs, so. Um, any other thoughts pe folks have um, on that or things that questions or concerns you've heard from folks about, about that? Yeah, go ahead, Donna. 
Well, I, th I think a lot will depend if you belong to one before. They were very much local neighborhood and organic from those people who showed up, who opted in. The one thing the city did do was put that information on the website so people could find who was their coordinator or when the group was meeting. So I would hope it would continue in that van vein as, as Anne stated, it's very much individualized to who says yes and shows up and does what they want to do. As they I share think that it's a information good with us, we will make sure that gets pushed out. I don't think they're quite there yet. Right. Okay, well that's a, a good call though, so that people okay. have a place where they could just go look that up. That makes sense. Cool, anything else on, on that topic? Ah, no, couldn't agree yeah, more. Kind of like, yeah, let's let it happen a bit organically. I don't think there's a cookie cutter approach for any of this stuff. Um, even the number of neighborhoods, uh, I had a good chat with Dan. And what's been great is like some of the local organizers who I've never spoken to before have been reaching out, asking about city resources, asking for the best way to distribute them. So I think it's a beautiful thing. It's great. Cool. Great. Anything else? Okay, um, super. So coming back to our agenda here, I think that is the end of our regular business. Um, so uh, I guess we're on to council reports. Um, I'm gonna, again, go in the order that I would if we were in the horseshoe, um, but it's only really because Donna, you're always so ready like right away tonight i'm ready to to be glad that things are working better except for your your experience and yeah, but that's, it's all but good I just, have to, just really spend my time thanking bill and cameron the staff uh jasmine who's not here and just make sure all the heads of departments all the staff that's there working as well as furloughed uh, just shows the quality of people we have so thank you very much for being there and just being who you are that's all. Yeah. Great. Uh, Connor. Yeah, I, I don't have much. I would echo that. Um, just people watching. As far as the city manager's office, there's been zero disruption as far as getting in touch with people and everything going uh, as far as plan. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I think Montpelier is doing a great job with the social just distancing. I took my dog for a walk on the new bike path extension the other day. And it was great to see people like, you know, eight feet apart walking there, but getting their exercise, enjoying the outdoors. Um, and I, I, I think we're, uh, we're up to the task. We're doing a great job in Montpelier. So thanks everybody. Great. Uh, Jay. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just echo what uh, Donna and Connor said about the, the efforts of the staff. Thanks so much. Um, you're right. We're not just, circumstances, things aren't, aren't missing a beat. Um, I'll, I'll just add one little bit that um, uh, as of yesterday, uh, Montpelier Live has brought uh, a person on in collaboration with the NDC um, and a, another organization to be a, a business consultant and navigator to work with local businesses. Um, and there's still a lot of uh, details to get worked out in terms of the arrangement and how it's all going to play out. But some uh, a woman who can um, sort of work with, with local business owners, help them navigate all of these, the, the opportunities that are, are there for them now, um, and sort of these, these rough waters that they're facing ahead and connect them to um, a, a pretty extensive network of resources um, to be able to, to help them uh, stay afloat. So more details on that to come, but I just want to, I think it's part of acknowledging the, the grassroots effort that's happening in the city to, uh, you know, community-based to, to help, uh, help everybody get through all this. Great. Uh, Jack. Um, I don't, really have anything to add. I think that our, our city our city workers, our city our professional city workers have done such a great job. I think that they show great dedication to the people in the city and I express my appreciation for all to all of them. Okay. Dan, I'm sorry, I forgot where people sit. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, and so I actually had two two issues. One um, that I had 
uh, received from Onion River Outdoors, and I had circulated suggesting whether we wanted to address this or not. And um, Montpelier Alive is is on it, and this deals with the uh, payroll protection program. And uh, I spoke with uh, Dan Groberg at the uh, at Montpelier Alive, and he he felt that you know they were handling it, and, and the issue in a nutshell is that the payroll protection program right now doesn't give a lot of flexibility to small businesses that might want to pay full time for a few employees or a little bit more for a few employees to fulfill their different business needs than keeping everybody on the payroll at a lower level. Um, and so they were actually having trouble keeping up with the online orders and they needed more flexibility. We, Dan suggested that we as a council may want to consider um, or as a city you know, basically writing to the federal, knowing we don't have any control over it, writing to the federal uh, delegation saying, you know, we support any additional flexibility for small businesses using the PPP um, and allowing them to have greater flexibility in how they apply it. And I, I think that may make sense whether we want to do it, you know, now or, um, you know, after, after the meeting. Um, and the second issue is I received a letter from a constituent about landlord tenant issues, which is there's a number of uh, properties that are advertising for, you know, vacancies or people seeking apartments. Uh, and they were confused as to where they might receive guidance as to like how to safely um, show an apartment or visit an apartment if they're, if they're transitioning. And obviously we don't have the, that, but we may want to add or connect on our COVID-19 website as to any site that um, you know, would give advice to people that, that are either renting or seeking to rent um, vacant spaces, how to do that, how to transition an apartment safely. Um, we, can, we can take a look at that, Dan, but I will tell you, I was talking to a realtor uh, just yesterday and they've set pretty set standards for how to show a house. Uh, okay. Like with one person in at a time, uh, you know, got to stand, have to have masks, gloves. Uh, it's all right. pretty, and I can't imagine it be any different to show an apartment than it is to show, you know, real estate. So, uh, I, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine that that's much different either. But I think what this one, this person particularly, who you know, they're, you know, we have a lot of people that are not necessarily professional landlords. Oh, right. That right. you know, no, we can try to find it, but. I, yeah, but I think all I'm saying is I think there is very specific guidance about how it's supposed to be done. That's already been issued. Right. Great. Good. Yeah, I'm not looking to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> so if it's there, but that would be a great thing to link. But I, I, I think we should also think about the the PPP and supporting the small businesses if they need if they want more flexibility on that as well. Do you think that Dan, um, together with either the MBA or uh, potentially in collaboration with this new hire, do you think they may be interested in, in like drafting something up for us? Uh, I'll, I can certainly reach out to Dan and, and just say if, if, uh, if we take the temperature of the board, I mean, the council and, and we all support this idea, but yeah, I think they're already handling it. And certainly I think they could say, you know, the city council supports it. I just think you know, last time around when, when this was started, when we, we sent a letter to the state basically saying, you know, hold off on evictions and foreclosures during this crisis, or we, you know, not that we have any power to, to say one way or the other. I think this is just one of those instances as well, where the more we can support these local businesses, you know, the decisions could be made at the federal level, but, you know, advocating it just sh certainly shows the support that we give to them. Agreed. I think you can really, you know, um, in terms of expediting the process, if you just want to direct the city manager to send a letter on your behalf, then you don't have to wait till March, May 13th to see a draft. Uh, we'll get the gist of That would do make we, me happy. That would do, we, uh, do we need a motion to that effect? Probably. Yeah, that I can say yeah. as directed, you know, on behalf of Montpelier City Council, we urge you to make these funds more flexible for small businesses. And to send more money to local governments. So so moved. <laughs> I'll second, second that. Yeah. Okay, we got multiple seconds. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, great.
Uh, thanks for raising that. Yep. Thanks. That's all. Yep. Uh, Lauren. Yeah. Thanks. Just a couple of things that have. Um, and have come up from some constituents. Uh, really glad to hear about all the great work Montpelier Alive, because definitely have been hearing some um, concerns from our local businesses. Uh, so glad to know that that resource is getting up and going. Um, also have heard from some people being challenged with our unemployment insurance, which of course isn't being handled by the city, but you know whatever help and facilitation we can provide to folks. And hopefully a lot of that backlog has been cleared, um, but certainly if we can be helpful and helping make calls or, you know, just keeping beating the drums of what needs to be done there. I know it's been really challenging for a lot of folks. Um, one other issue that um, I've heard in various formats about um, is related to CSOs, our combined sewer overflows, and just wanted to note in our consent agenda, we did approve money for a new flow monitoring system. And I would urge anyone who's very interested in that issue, um, one of the things that a federal stimulus could do would be putting money into the, the CSO program and put people to work uh, doing construction projects and things to um, build and improve our um, our infrastructure, including CSO. So um, I know in my day job, we put in uh, a letter to the federal delegation that's been in conversations and that was one of the things we asked for. Um, but that's a place where, you know, if people want to see us doing more work sooner on something like CSOs, I would urge people to uh, advocate for that uh, federal stimulus funding um, when people get to that. So just wanted to note here, that here. opportunity. Um, <laughs> and um, Dan Jones, on behalf of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, had sent around a note. Um, it is Earth Day, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day today. Um, and they're launching a writing contest to imagine the best possible future for Montpelier 30 years from now. So um, look out for information about that. They're offering $500 prizes in five categories. Um, it's running through June 23rd, and they're going to be having writers uh, kind of narrow it down and then have um, community members vote on their favorites. Um, so it sounds like a fun way when we're all um, socially isolating to uh, check that out, think about what kind of vision and a brighter future. So look out for information about that from the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Um, and just wanted to echo the appreciation for all the hard work from uh, city staff and everyone who is, is you know, just amazed by how smoothly you all are making it look from the outside and from um, our operations, knowing what a challenging time and you know, with a third of the staff furloughed right now. So thank you all. And is that Jamie Carroll on? Just saying hi. Hi, hey, Jamie. <laughs> hi, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. We miss you. Hello, thank you. Oh, she knows how to do a thumbs up. That's pretty cool. <laughs> That's all for me. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So, uh, gosh, how do you do that? Oh, please. I was waving now. Reactions. Oh, there we go. Reactions. Oh, I got it. Okay. Now I can't undo it. <laughs> It'll go away. <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right, so... Um, for, how, do you, how do you kick it? No. Well, it just goes away, I guess. It goes oh, away. I see, okay. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I also... What's that? So Jamie inspired us to get more yes. familiar with our gizmos. Um, I also, I also want to thank city staff um, for your continued uh, professionalism through all of this, uh, and you know, even with uh, finding so much money for you know to, to save through the the shortfall, and that we've also just found another sixty thousand dollars. Like that's that's amazing, and you know, still shaking the trees uh, there. It's it's very impressive and so grateful for all of your work, um, both financially as well as just, you know, keeping the lights on and, um, you know, continuing to follow through with the essential services. So, so grateful for everyone's work um, and city staff. Um, and then um, uh, 
I just want to make a note uh, about the railroad. Uh, I got some questions about what what's happening on Saban's Pasture and uh, along Old Country Club Road, and and maybe Bill, you, maybe I, I should let you speak to this. But um, they're you know continuing to do work on the tracks there. They were there. I really should say they started to do work on the tracks uh, there uh, through an. Uh, right of way that the railroad has there. And um, so there are gonna be some closures sort of uh, on a intermittently uh, going forward. Um, anything else you wanna add about that, uh, Bill or Cameron? I don't have anything specific. I think if people, for council members or members of the public, last Friday's city manager's uh, weekly report had a pretty extensive write-up from DPW about this. And that's probably the best place to explain it. Uh, this is the new rail siding that we've been talking about. Uh, we thought uh, there was gonna be discussion in the legislature about appropriating money for this this year, but for somehow or some way, they've decided to just go ahead. And uh, no one here really knew that was gonna happen until it started happening. So uh, not the best effort of communication from either the railroad or the Trans Rail Division, but it's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. All right, well, and that is uh, it for me for now. And just, well, I guess I'll add one more thing, which is just great. Um, I'm just very grateful for uh, folks who are continuing with the social distancing and um, uh, wearing masks. Uh, and, and for those who are supporting local businesses, uh, you know, considering uh, taking out food or shopping online, et cetera, to help uh, our businesses through this tough time. That's it for me. Uh, John. Uh, nothing to say except that it's so lonely in this giant office all by myself every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Fair enough. Uh, Bill. <laughs> Bill, do you have anything to add? Um, I know nothing really specific. I guess I would like to also thank all of our staff people. People are really working hard. I uh, appreciate all the kind words from you folks. And um, then uh, through this process of you know, following tales from around the country and in many communities, uh, this, this situation is causing big rifts between elected officials and the city staffs. Uh, you know, everybody blaming everybody else for something which is really out of everyone's control. And uh, I think we've all been working together and I, I know everyone in City Hall and around City Hall feels it. And uh, so thank, thank you. And I really think Cameron, she's taking our lead on this COVID stuff. And as you know, I'm home. So she's really the, where the, the uh, rubber hits the road there at City Hall these days. So I appreciate her keeping things moving. Cool. All right, well, I think that is everything for the evening. Um, so with that, we will consider this meeting adjourned. Thanks everyone.